Good morning. All right, I want you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 9. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 9, I'm going to be there shortly. Back in the summer of 1991, there was a tennis pro named David Wheaton, and uh, he should have been on top of the world. He was ranked 12th internationally. And he had won the two million Grand Slam, uh, two million dollar Grand Slam of tennis, which back in 1991, for me, that's a lot of money at any time in life, right? Uh, but this day, it feels like a million or two million is not that much around these parts, right? Uh, but back in '91, man, he was on top of the world. He had more money than others. He had more fame than most could dream of. And yet, in the midst of all of that success, he realized that there was something missing. You ever heard stories like that? I mean, it happens all the time. This is just the one that I chose of David Wheaton. But we know so many people who have all the fame, all the money, all the stuff that when the world would look from their point of view, they would look at that individual and say, you have everything that you need to be happy. And yet there's something missing. There's a hole that no amount of money, no amount of success no amount of relationships with other people will ever be able to fill. And that hole can only be filled through Jesus Christ. And, and so in his interview, he said that he finally found what he was looking for when he later committed his life to Jesus. You know, we've all heard stories of people who hit rock bottom before they turned their life over to Jesus. Now, here's the misconception that I don't want to throw out there. It's not as if it, when I give my life to Jesus, then all of a sudden I'm going to have all the money and all the fame and all the problems in my life are going to go away. But there's that emptiness within you, that void within you. You ever felt that before? Just unsettled. As if I can't find peace, I can't find rest, I can't find satisfaction, I can't find hope, and only Jesus can be the provider for those kinds of things in your life. Ultimately, now there's temporary satisfaction that you may never that, that you may find, but it will never fill you with everlasting peace. Our lesson comes from the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, and it deals with the Israelites. And as it turned out, these Israelites learned the same thing that David Wheaton learned: that no amount of success or achievement means anything without God. And so the book of Nehemiah is all about rebuilding, right? It's rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem, if you remember. And it's under the leadership of this godly man. His name is Nehemiah. And by the way, uh, there's more study that I would love to do at some point in Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a great leader. He was a man that you naturally want to follow. You know people like that? Just when they open their mouth and they begin to speak, you say, man, I will follow that man. I will follow that woman wherever they go because they are a natural leader. That was Nehemiah. He was that kind of person for the entire nation to want to follow. He was a great leader. But after Israel finished rebuilding the wall in chapter 6, they soon realized that there was more to life, more to their nation than just brick and mortar and putting back a physical wall. And so they began to get it right, which is saying something for Israel <laughs> because they knew how to get it wrong a lot of times. And yet finally they get it right in this moment as they decide what we need is to turn our hearts towards God. Now, sadly, here's the truth. Some churches never understand that. Uh, I, I know of one church, literally, uh, their mission was a building project. The, the church started and was established, and they said, if we build a beautiful building, people will come. Okay, this was a church that I know of, and so they went, they built this building, and, and it was, it was beautiful. The new auditorium, new foyer, uh, new fellowship hall, right? They had all, the new parking lot, like everything was perfect with this building. It was a beautiful building, but when... The vision, and, and by the way, the members, they rolled up their sleeves. They got on board with that, and they started to work to make this building gorgeous. And then after the building was built and the building project was finished, people didn't know what to do. 
And, and they didn't know how else to work. That's how they had spent their time. That's how their faith was exercised, was on this building. And so when the building project was done, they had no other vision. And they slowly began to die within the walls of a beautiful building. You see, the Israelites often made mistakes, but at least they didn't make that mistake in this moment. They knew that more than any rebuilt wall or city, they needed to rebuild their relationship with the Lord. How much success would our nation and our churches and our families have if we had that same vision as well? To know that more than building up a beautiful-looking nation or a beautiful-looking building or a beautiful-looking family on the outside, we needed to establish a relationship with the Lord that goes deeper. That's what we need, folks. You want to know why our country is hurting? You want to know why our families are breaking? It's because of a lack of the Lord. It's a lack of vision and eyes focused not on self, but on Him. And so in Nehemiah chapter 8, the Israelites, they ask Ezra to read to them from the uh, law of God. And, and so it's a, a beautiful deal. Look at chapter 8, and we'll go through verses 1 through 3. By the way, we have an Ezra here as well who can read us the book of the law. So if we literally want to follow in their steps, we can make it happen. I thought about calling on Ezra to read my text for me this morning, but I won't do that to you, bro. Uh, chapter 8, start in verse 1. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their town, all the people assembled, I love this, as one man. Right? It's this, this idea, of, and you apply it how you want. You can apply a nation. For them, it was a nation. For us, it could be a nation. It could be a church family, or it could be your individual family. But these people, diverse as they were, came together as one man, one single unit, and the two shall become one flesh. And here they are standing as one man in the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. And so on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. And he read it aloud from daybreak to noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men and women and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. By the way, here, let me go on because I think this is cool too as well. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. That, folks, is the first pulpit ever mentioned in Scripture. <laughs> All right, let's skip on down. I want to keep going. Verses 8 and 9. They read the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. They said, we don't want to talk in, in language that people can't understand. They wanted to take the word of God and put it down and apply it on their everyday level. There, there's a reason that they said this in this way. There, it's not just reading the book of the law for looks. Man, I'm reading this because God's word will change my life. So they said, get it down on our level where we can understand what was being read. In verse 9, Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were all instructing the people said to them all, this day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. I mean, what a beautiful thing that's going on here. These people have gathered as one person and they said, here's what we need to do. Ezra, bring out the word to us. We need the word of the Lord in our life right now. They had the beautiful building. The wall is restored. They could celebrate. They could do these things. But no, they said what we need is we need to invite God into our lives. And they were so touched by what God was doing within them that they're now weeping as the word is being read. And Nehemiah is like, hey, you don't need to weep. You don't need to mourn. This is something you should celebrate. But they were so pricked to the heart because they began to acknowledge the need of God in their life. Look now at verse 18 as well. Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. 
and they celebrated the feast for seven days. And on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. And so these people, they've gathered as one man. They've asked for God to come into their life. And they didn't just say, we're going to have a special service. We're going to have a special moment. They said, we're going to change our lives. We're going to change how we live. We are going to live every day with the word of God being poured into us. And so it says in verse 18 that these people then, after the walls rebuilt, after they had this moment where Ezra read from the scripture, then it says, and day after day, they did the same thing. You want to know why the nation began to flip at this point in time and things began to take a turn for the best in the nation? It's because their focus changed off of self and onto him. And they said, God, we want more. Can you see the craving within these people? By the way, there's a reason, again, not the sermon I want to preach right now, but Nehemiah, what a great leader he was. He gets an entire nation to come together as one and say, I want more of Jesus. I want more of the word. I want more of God. Man, that's what we need, isn't it? A craving and a yearning for more of him. And so as a result of the people hearing the law read and explained to them day after day, this revival begins to break out in Jerusalem. People were on fire for, for the Lord. And so as you move into chapter 9, which is where we're going to spend our time, after the law has been built, after the law has been read, the people begin to set things right with God. Because, man, Israel up to this point has made a lot of mistakes. But now they're ready to really make some change. And so in this lesson this morning, I'm going to lay out four things, four steps that I find in Nehemiah chapter 9 that we, like the Israelites, we need to take in order to get things right with God. And, and wouldn't you say that, man, as a whole, there's some things that we need to get right with God about. And so let's do that together. Number one is this. They looked inward. Everybody say Inward. Uh, look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 9. On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and having dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves uh, from all foreigners, and they stood in their places, and they confessed their sins and the wickedness of their fathers. These Israelites, they're looking inwards. You notice that. They're looking at themselves, they're examining themselves and their lives as they're listening to this law being read by Ezra. And they realize how far away they had drifted from God. Because that's, by the way, that's what happens when we stop and begin to examine ourselves. That's why we, we want to meditate. Scripture talks so much about meditating and examining and slowing down and and self-examination, Paul calls it depth of insight. The reason that there's so many scriptures about this is because when we begin to look inward, we find where we are in relationship to the Lord. And Israel says, man, I have strayed away from who God wants me to be. You relate with that this morning? Is that where you are to say, man, maybe I need to get some things back to where God wants them to be? And that's where Israel was. And so as an entire nation, they turned their hearts towards the Lord. And what I love is they're not coming to the Lord asking for vengeance, which they do a lot. Not this time. They didn't come to the Lord asking for freedom. And they didn't come to the Lord asking for victory. They came to the Lord recognizing that what they needed more than anything else was to be right with God. They said, God, forgive us. God, change us from the inside out. They were coming to God and saying, God, cleanse me. Restore not my city, not my nation, not wipe away my enemies, not give me victory. They said, restore me. Man, that's powerful. Now, as they're looking at themselves, here's what I want us to notice. This whole looking inward process that Nehemiah and these Israelites display for us, they're not looking shallow on the surface level kind of stuff, right? It's a deep examining of themselves. Have, have you ever gone to the dentist and before you go, you're like, oh man, I've got a dentist appointment today. What are you going to do? I'm going to brush my teeth and I'll tell you what, I'm even going to floss, right? 
And so I'm in there and I'm working and I'm going to brush, I'm going to scrub, I'm going to floss until my gums bleed. Because when I go to the dentist, I want them to look in my mouth and say, you've been good. And for whatever reason, I always think that if I just really brush my teeth super hard right before I go, if I floss right before I go, then it's all going to be good. But what happens is, is they take x-rays, they have tools that dig down into places I didn't know existed in my mouth, and they will always find something there and typically say, uh, you need to floss more. They got me. How? Because they're looking deeper. And when you look deeper, you will find that there are some things that were there that you didn't even know existed. And the Lord is saying those need to be removed and replaced with something holy. Right? I, I, every time I talk about this concept of removing something from your life, I also have to talk about replacing it with something better. Because there's scripture that abounds on the subject of if you leave something and you've removed sin from it, but you don't replace that sin with something holy, something worse is going to come take place of that sin. And you're going to be worse off than you were before. Right? And so it's this concept of saying, yeah, I'm going to go to the dentist and get my teeth cleaned, remove the stuff, but I've now got to fill it with something good. I've got to floss daily. I've got to scrub daily. I've got to get into a new habit, a new routine, a new life. And the Lord is saying to this, these Israelites, let's build something new. And he's talking about much more than just a wall. He's talking about a life. And so they look inward. And the same thing is true for us. If we want to get things straight with God, if you want to get things in your life matched up to where God wants you to be, or at least closer to where he wants you to be, it starts by, number one, looking inward. But number two, they also do this. They look, everybody say this after me, upward. Nehemiah 9 contains the longest prayer in the Bible. Did you know that? Nehemiah chapter 9, starting in verse 5. It says, and the Levites... Uh, we're going to skip all the names. I'm not going to read all those. They said, stand up and praise the Lord your God. Notice the upward look. Praise the Lord your God who is firm or, or who is from everlasting to everlasting. And just listen to some of this prayer. Blessed be your glorious name and may it, your name, be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful to you, and you made a covenant with him to give his descendants Descendants, the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Pezzarites, Jebusites, and Girgashites. You have kept your promise because you are righteous. Notice the emphasis on the Lord. These people are looking up. The Israelites, they're, they're well aware of their sin. And, and it's good that they look inward. And so uh, I've already stressed the importance of examining yourself and saying, man, there's some things that need to get cleaned out of my life. <laughs> but then there's also this shift in perspective. Even though as healthy as it is for us to look inward, we can't stay inward looking too long. Some of you are your own worst enemy. Some of you can't get out of your own head. Some of you have the best plans of who you could be, but it never turns into anything because it stays between your ears and never moves to your hands and feet. You've got to get over you. And the way to do that is to get your eyes off of yourself. Uh, I call it navel gazing. Looking down at yourself for too long. You got to get your eyes off of you and get your eyes onto the author and perfecter of your faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross. You've got to look at Jesus. Amen. And when we begin to look upward, we can begin to find victory in our life in places we hadn't before. And that's what starts to happen in this revival for Israel as Nehemiah leads them. They find victory over things they hadn't before. They become a stronger nation than they had ever been before because they look inward, they examine themselves, but they don't stay inward because they shift to look upward. And so just like the Israelites, seeing that 
our sin is forgiven, man, we can't help but praise and worship our God. See, they acknowledged their sin, but then they looked up and said, but yet you've forgiven me of that sin. You've cleansed me of that sin, and now I praise you for it. And this is a beautiful prayer that you can go home and read later of how much they shift their perspective to God. And so getting straight with God, basically, here's my point. It means getting your eyes off of yourself and turning them on to Jesus. You know that, that old hymn that we sing? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And so when you look at him, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. When you turn your eyes on Jesus, the things of this earth will go strangely dim in his light. The light of what? His glory and his grace. Man, I love that. That's a beautiful song. And so we look inward, we look upward, but if you notice in Nehemiah 9, there's also this looking backward. Say it after me, looking backward. And so their prayer in Nehemiah 9 acknowledges that as a nation, they haven't always been faithful to God. Finally, they get it, right? There's this horrible cycle. Whenever you read the Old Testament, do you just get mad at Israel? You know what I mean? It's so frustrating until you realize that Israel is really just a shadow of us. Or excuse me, we are actually the reflection of them. Maybe that's how I should say that, right? When you realize that's exactly what we do to the Lord. But man, if you just read through it, you're like, how in the world could you guys go? The Lord brings them to the Red Sea. And then he brings them through it. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But it just, it blows my mind every single time that when they're now in the wilderness, they have been set free from the ones who have abused them and mistreated them. Israel says, why did you bring us out here? Send us back to Egypt because we were better there. I mean, there's just this, this huge pattern. If you read the book of Judges, you're going to see this cycle that begins to play out time and time again. Uh, they follow in idolatry. They start to worship other gods. And so God sends somebody to oppress them and to tell them, hey, stop it. And so then they start to repent, they cry out to God, they finally pray, and so God sends a judge or a redeemer or someone to set them free, only that they'll turn back to idolatry again. And there's just this horrible cycle that just keeps going on. And after a while, you're like, guys, stop the pattern, right? Someone said it best, I believe he was Albert Einstein, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different things. Results. And man, it's so frustrating, isn't it, to watch somebody just do something when you go, I know the outcome before you do it. You ever been frustrated with a family member? Because, and, and they'll come to you and they'll cry on your shoulder and they'll pray with you and they'll say, I just want to get out of this. And you say, then do something different. Sorry, you don't say that probably that strongly, but you want to, right? Don't be so foolish. Change something. If you're going to sit in the same dysfunction every day, then why do you suddenly think it will become functional if you don't do something different? And yet, that's exactly how we live. It's easy to get frustrated when it's somebody else's dysfunction. But when I look inward and I start to look upward, I might begin to recognize, man, I do a lot of looking backward. And looking backward is not a bad thing. Living Backwards is a bad thing, right? A rear view mirror is for glancing at. It's not for driving in. You have a rear view mirror, but nobody drives by looking in the rear view mirror. You glance at it every now and then because if you don't look in the rear view mirror, you will wreck the car. But if you only look at the rear view mirror, you will wreck the car, right? There's a balance here. There's a saying, you probably know it. Those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. You forget the past, man. You're going to repeat it. And so if we don't take a long, healthy look backwards from time to time, we're liable to make the same mistakes and commit the same sins 
day after day and year after year. And I'm thankful for a God's grace that can still cover me from that. But man, don't you want to be free from being who you were yesterday? And so in order to be free from who I was yesterday, listen to me, I have to look back into yesterday. I can't change if I don't reflect on what I did and what was the outcome. Israel had to look back, and they did. You, you can read this in chapter 9, and you're going to see they reflect back on what they've done and the mistakes they've made, and they begin to say, we're going to change some things. But it's only through looking backward that you can begin to change some things. But you know, some people never learn. There's this guy who was a, he hired a pilot, and he wanted this pilot to take him caribou hunting in Canada. And so he asked this pilot to land in a remote place. And the pilot said, well, there's not any caribou in this area. The hunter said, well, there were last year. I hunted here, and I know what I'm talking about. And so sure enough, a few hours later after they land, the hunter returns, and he's dragging two caribou. The pilot said, oh, okay. And so as he got ready to load the plane, the pilot said, well, you can't load two caribou on this plane. The plane can't bear the weight. And the hunter said, well, I did last year. It was the same size plane, same size caribou. I know what I'm talking about. So reluctantly, the pilot took off. But as it turned out, the plane couldn't carry the load after all, and it crashed into the side of a mountain. And the pilot's angry with the hunter, and the pilot said, I can't believe I let you talk me into this. I knew that plane couldn't carry two, uh, two caribou. Now we're stranded on this mountain, and no one's ever going to find us. And the hunter said, don't worry, the rescue squad will find us. They did last year. <laughs> Looking backward helps us not to repeat the same mistakes again and again and again. When we look backwards, we can say, you know what? There's some things I want to change because I don't like this cycle that I'm in. Folks, we live in cycles. Like it or not, we're naturally comfortable in cycles. And here's the problem. We're comfortable in dysfunctional cycles. A lot of times we would rather stay in our sin and stay with our addiction and stay with our mess because at least I know what tomorrow's chaos will look like. Sometimes we're too scared to pray for change. <coughs> we want it. We'll come to a family member and cry for it. But then we're not willing to do anything to change it. And that's Israel. Until this point. And folks, if Israel could reach this point, then so can we. So can we. And so can that family member who you think has no hope and could never change. This might be the morning for them where they say, you know what? I'm going to look inward. I'm going to look upward. And I'm going to start to look backward. But it's not all going to be complete until lastly, I look, repeat after me, forward. Verse 38, it says, in view of all of this, we are making a binding agreement we're putting it in writing in our leaders, our Levites and our priests are affixing their seals to it. The Israelites are finally deciding to get serious about getting things right with God. And they, they don't want to just change for a day. They want to keep it that way. Right? And so they go so far as to put it in writing. And if you look in chapter 10, verses 28 and 29, they take an oath before God that they are going to remain faithful to Him and that they're going to keep His law. And so here's the thing. Listen, they had a goal in their mind because they were looking forward to where they wanted to be spiritually. And then they put it on paper. Notice that. They put it in writing. They got it down out of their mind and onto paper. Because the goal to moving forward is to get your goals and your dreams out of your head. If they stay up here, you lose. If they stay up here, then you're only a person with great potential. But when you put them on the paper, and you speak them out loud, and you swear an oath by God, and you say, I am changing something today. God, I'm scared. I don't know what this is going to look like. I've been an alcoholic, my mom would say, for eight years. But today, the preacher's wife is coming forward. And on that day, things changed. 
and they change for the better. Was it easy? I promise you it's not. Change is never easy. But God calls us to a life of being shaped. And being shaped doesn't happen by staying where you are, folks. You will never be shaped if you're not willing to move. If you want to be changed, then you have to change something yourself. God will ultimately be the one who shapes you, but you've got to be the one to take the step. It's like crossing the, the, the River Jordan the second time. Remember the Israelites come to the sea, and it's at flood stage, and God says, if you want the, the river to part for you this time, you've got to take the first step. And then when they stepped into the river, then God parted the water. But God would not have parted the water if they would not have stepped out of their comfort zone and into what they would have considered to be a dangerous situation. You're scared because you say, if I come forward and I start to tell people about what's really going on in my life, if they knew who I really was, they would know that I'm not fit to lead this ministry. If they knew who I was, they would know that I'm not fit to even sit in this room with them. If they knew what I really struggled with, then they would judge me. They would never view me the same. I would embarrass my family, and I would let those around me down. I can't change. But then we go home, we lay our heads down on our pillow, and our prayer through our tears is, God, please get me out of this. I wonder how often God's saying, I've already provided the way. I'm just waiting for you to take the first step. You know, there's a, I, I love this, there's an Australian, the Australian coat of arms, okay, is a picture of an emu and a kangaroo. And the reason that they chose it, because you would look at that and you'd say, well, that's ridiculous. Why is that the coat of arms? And the reason is, is because there's the two animals who cannot go backwards. They can only move forwards. An emu has three toes, and because of that on each foot, it can't go backwards for whatever reason. The kangaroo has its tail and it prevents it from moving backwards. Those two animals can only move forwards. Folks, that's how we need to be in our relationship with Jesus. We need to be people who look back, but we don't move back. We need to glance back and say, that's who I was yesterday. This is what worked. This is what didn't. This is what I need to change. But you know what? I'm not going back there. I'm moving forward. Where are you going in your spiritual life? Do you know? Or are you just... Showing up to church. You see, a lot of times, this is your vision. Before I was here as your preacher, you had this in place. But when I look at this from the pew, when I first got here, these don't look like check boxes to me. Is that what they are to you? I hope not. Well, sharing life as a grace-filled and diverse community. I go to a connect group, check. Engaging in life-changing worship. Well, we have a Sunday morning service, check. Is that how you do those? You see, because this word right here to me is the most powerful word in the vision statement outside of Jesus Christ. Okay. Being shaped. I'm being shaped. Shaping is never done on this side of heaven unless you're someone named Jesus. And so for us, these are not check boxes. This is something where you say every single day, I don't care how spiritual you are, when you sit in your pew and you look at this vision, you begin to say, how can I engage in life-changing worship even more than I did yesterday? How can I share life as a grace-filled and diverse community even more than I did yesterday? You know, what if we did this? What if we did this as families? What if you went home tonight as parents? and you got your family together, all the kiddos, and you sat around with everyone in your household, and you prayed, you had a little family devo time, and then you asked your family, I want each of you to come up with something that you want to accomplish in your faith. What do you want to do better? What do you want to serve? And it doesn't mean that just because I choose something, it means I'm doing bad at that. right? Notice how many times in Scripture, uh, Paul says to people, hey, you love great, but do it even more so. You have great faith, but I'm asking you to have even greater faith. right? And so look at your family. Challenge them spiritually. Have spiritual conversations with your, your family, please. Don't just depend on the church to be for your family what you were meant to be. Church was not ever established to replace the parent's role. 
Church was established to encourage brothers and sisters to have that same faith along in that journey. It's not a replacement for your family. Family units, I challenge you. Write down some goals tonight. You guys use this outline. All of you look inward. All of you look upward together. All of you look backwards and say, how are we doing? What was last year? What were the highs and lows of last year? If it's too hard, start with this week. What were the highs and lows of this last week? And then you look forward together and you put it on writing just as they did. And you say, as they did in Nehemiah, man, we're going to write this down. We're going to hold each other accountable because we are a family of faith. And we're going to intentionally move forward. When's the last time we did that as a church? We have staff meetings. Do we look forward? We have elders meetings. Do we look forward? We have ministry leader meetings. Do we look forward? As a church family, are we looking forward? We don't want to be like the church who had the vision of having the prettiest building and then no other plans. The problem wasn't that they had a building project. The problem was is that that was their only vision. There's no movement in a building project. Right? We need some, we need some faith. So in our meetings, do we say, rather than just resolving issues, do we say, how can we be better as a church family? How can we be better as leaders? How can we grow from where we are to where God wants us to be? What steps are we taking to make this happen? Are we writing those things down on paper and holding each other accountable to those things? It matters. It matters. What about as a nation? What if we did that? What if we cried out for the law of the Lord and said, I just want to read this, and we were pricked by it, and we said, you know what? We're going to look inward, upward, backwards, and we're going to move forwards. My challenge for you this morning is I don't know where you are in your faith. But wherever you are, I'm praying that you're looking ahead to who you want to be. If you've just been going through the motions of church, shame on you. And shame on me. It's time that we started to take our faith as seriously as those Israelites did in Nehemiah and as Nehemiah did as their leader and to say, we're not content with being who we were. We are content to be shaped into the image of Jesus Christ. Mold me and make me after your will. Right? You're the potter, I'm the clay. And being the clay is not comfortable. Can you imagine if clay could speak? <laughs> I'm sure it'd be saying a lot of things because it's not comfortable, but that piece of pottery will be beautiful as it's shaped by the hands of the master architect who can transform it from who it, it, what it was into who it will become. And the same will happen with you. And so this morning, if you're ready to make a change, if you're sick of the pattern of your life, if you are tired of crying yourself to sleep every night, if you're tired of getting phone calls from your family members who are falling apart, if you're tired of seeing your kids go astray, and if you're ready to make a change about it, then the lesson is yours. And God may just be waiting for you to take the first step to come forward as together we stand and sing.